Software Engineering Radio Episode 41, Architecture Part 4. Welcome to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. This is episode number four of... No, it's not actually episode number four. It's the fourth in our software architecture series of episodes. And it's probably also the last one with the title Software Architecture. We'll have related topics, of course, in the future. But this is... Anyway, this is number four. Um, it's about architectural styles and patterns. And it's, again, Michael and myself... And um, so, Michael, I think you'd like to start explaining what architectural styles and patterns actually are. Yes, and I I like to begin with uh, describing the situation where we are cu currently. We assume that you have uh, 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 you assigned your responsibilities, that you have found the responsibilities of your system um, to fulfill your uh, functional requirements, your your features, for example, by using CRC cards and. Um, you uh, now have uh, basically a, a domain model of your system. You know the dependencies, you have the responsibilities described, and now you have a set of non-functional requirements, you have constraints, you might have already some technology decisions, and you have uh, technology constraints. And now you need to find a suitable, I, I call it uh, technical architecture, in that you insert your functional architecture, that you uh, remodel your functional architecture, um, uh, compose it, uh, partition it um, into the technical architecture. And here you need to find uh, suitable structures. And the structures, um, the, the proven best practices here, are um, very often described as patterns, uh, though we will also describe general techniques and concepts beyond patterns. So historically, I think it was like that. So some people started to identify certain architectural styles. I think these were the SEI folks. And then a subset of these styles have been re redescribed or reformulated as patterns in POSA 1. And therefore we have both both terms architectural style and architectural pattern so so if i got it right what you just said then an architectural pattern is kind of something you apply to a set of domain objects in your domain model in order to kind of weld it into a form so that it can realize your non-functional requirements to, to basically realize the, the dependencies, the interactions between the domain objects that you uh, just identified. And uh, in your domain model, they have a straight relationship. They need to interact in some means. And now you um, define the means by which they interact. Right. So an architectural style, therefore, and also an architectural pattern is then a proven way to build a system specifically a proven way to realize certain non-functional requirements. You'll, you'll see during um, the, the episode that a certain um, architectural style, just like in building architecture, has certain characteristics. So you can recognize a certain architectural style or pattern if you look into a system and analyze it. And therefore, uh, an architectural style can also can also serve as a template to some extent or a guide, set of guidelines to guide the design of your architecture. Once you decided to use a certain style, a couple of consequences arise and that tell you basically how you should implement your system. And as usual with patterns, uh, architectural patterns and styles can help you document um, your architecture because if I go to Michael and say, hey, I've used the pipes and filters architecture, then he will know what I was talking about. Yes, if you then add for wh which responsibility, how, right. how, did, how did you decompose your system, how did right. you apply the pipes and right. filters, then I, it's crystal clear how the system will look like. I, I, I have a clear view, uh, I can imagine how the system looks like that he's talking about. Right. Typically, an architectural style is, is, made of, is made up of a set of building blocks, component types, artifacts, kinds of things, as well as their um, relationship and their connections. So, for example, just to, to peek into what we're going to talk about, the pipes and filters uh, architectural patterns, you have 
filters that are certain types of components that can manipulate data and they're connected using pipes which is basically a transport between adjacent filters and um, also um, an architectural style typically says something about constraints um, with regards to how you can combine the, the things that make up the pattern so to some extent just to connect this to some other topics um, to some extent this also it's almost like a meta model it, it basically defines things and you can apply this to your um, to your own environment or to your own new requirements and actually just to, to connect this um, if you work in model development you will often use architectural patterns as starting point for your own meta models they haven't been traditionally been formalized into meta models but the, the message is somewhat related and uh, an architectural pattern uh, differentiates itself from a design pattern um, by the level of as abstraction that it focuses on. So an architectural style or architectural pattern has a stronger impact, has a, I would say, global impact on the architecture, whereas a design pattern has a pretty localized impact on the design. Some people distinguish between strategic aspects of a system, which are the architectural patterns, and tactical aspects of an implementation, which would be the design patterns. Yeah, I like those names. And uh, POSA 1 uh, focuses specifically on those uh, architectural patterns, uh, whereas, for example, the golf book um, uh, focuses specifically on design patterns. Right. In, in this episode, we'll take a look at certain well-known uh, architectural patterns, um, basically those that are described in POSA 1. So if you read POSA 1, you can, you can stop listening. <laughs> um, so, But before we do that... Um, we'd like to at least hint at a number of other styles that have been described in various forms. So we'll briefly go through these um, styles and then we'll elaborate on some of them, specifically th those that have been designed, uh, described in POSA 1. So there are various high-level ways of building systems. One is um, the idea of having independent parts that are connected somehow. The other one is basically to describe a data flow through a system. You have systems that are data-centered, where you describe data structures and work on them. Then you have the ideas of virtual, the idea of virtual machines. And finally, um, um, basically a metaphor called call and return, where you basically invoke procedures. And below the independent parts category, you can, first of all, have a set of communicating processes using some kind of remote procedure call. You can have event or message-based systems, whereas the, they are... yeah. They are typically asynchronous, and between uh, under the communicating processes, you can often um, arrange things like plugins or component-based systems. And as I said, we're not going to go into details for all of those. In data flow systems, you can distinguish between uh, batch or sequential systems. Um, yeah, you all know them. Um, pipes and filters, which we'll describe later, and workflow systems where we explicitly describe uh, a workflow um, and then uh, execute actions as part of this workflow. In the data-centered um, design or architectural area, you either have typically a repository of data on which uh, different uh, applications work, and uh, if you add some AI, AI magic to it, this basically becomes a blackboard. Some people or many people say that repository and blackboard is basically the same. Um, in the virtual machine area, you can either build interpreters that um, interpret basically your, your script or your program. You can have rule-based systems and also you can have microkernels, which is somewhat different but also very important for complex systems that need to be portable over different operating systems or different hardware. Finally, in the call and return um, domain, you will typically find procedural systems, object-oriented systems, and also layers, whereas layers are somewhat different than the other two paradigms. The procedural and object-oriented are typically something you find on programming language level, whereas the layers pattern is really a pattern that you have to consciously implement. And then finally, there are two other techniques, which is frameworks and reflection. Um, they're kind of unrelated. They can't easily be uh, organized under one of the headings we talked about. Um, and for frameworks and for reflections, we will have separate episodes sometime in the future. So starting there, we'll now discuss some of the more important architectural patterns and we'll start with layers. <laughs> 
The layers pattern is typically used uh, pretty early in the architecting uh, phase uh, when when splitting the responsibilities. Um, it's advisable um, for many reasons that I come back to uh, to split the, the responsibilities uh, into layers and then group associated uh, responsibilities at the same level of abstraction typically into um, layers. Popular examples are, for example, the three-tier architectures where you uh, separated the persistence, the data store, from the actual business logic, from the presentation. And then, of course, you can uh, g grow on with, go on with that um, and say, well, we have a three, four, five, six-tier architecture where we just then separated out certain responsibilities uh, into an individual layer and uh, one of the key properties of the layer, one of the key constraints uh, that a uh, layers architecture imposes, that uh, you're only supposed to invoke the next uh, layer and um, top down. There is some exception that you might uh, do a, a hop uh, one or two layers down for performance optimization but reasons. You're only allowed to go down. Only allowed to go down, right. And uh, in in the pure form, it's only going one level down and coal and definitely not going up. And in the kind of relaxed uh, form, you can also go one or two layers down for optimization reasons. But um, in my experience, I always had to pay the price later at, at maintainability when when changing or extend extending the system. So just to add another example is of course the TCP. IP stack where you have those nicely defined, I think, seven layers just in the OC, ESO, OZ, OSI, whatever, uh, networking protocol stack. Yeah, the, the consequences of that is, of course, that you, um, she, it's, it's kind of an um, information hiding uh, principle that you shield um, um, upper layers from the details, from the implementation details of lower layers. <laughs> And uh, with that, of course, you get uh, better reuse, you get better maintainability, um, you minimize the dependencies uh, typically. Yeah, because you can you, you only depend on the level directly below you and everything below that is hidden. As a consequence uh, and as a liability, um, you have reduced efficiency because you might have uh, two or three hops involved uh, if you don't do the optimization, if you don't do uh, relax the, the, the constraints. Another um, liability is that uh, when whenever you change something in your system, you have cascades of, of changes that propagate through your system. Um, when you touch the presentation layer, which requires uh, some some kind of uh, data and you change the data, then you change, have to change also the business logic because that also touches the data. And, and so um, extending, for example, uh, your system into the address field with a new property um, it has a cascading uh, trickles changes. down through all the layers. Triggers down, yeah, yeah, can be annoying. But nonetheless, I think we we discussed this when preparing this episode. Um, this is maybe maybe the single most important architectural pattern, because it it's really, I mean, a system where you can't identify layers is probably probably bad design. Not always, but it's really an important metric. The next pattern we'd like to talk about is pipes and filters. And um, the idea is that you structure systems that you want to provide a structure for systems that process some kind of data stream. Uh, an example from one of my customers, uh, the European Southern Observatory, they're building radio telescopes. So they receive um, basically radio signals from one or many of their radio dishes and they have to filter it, they have to process it, they have to do all kinds of Fourier transformations and all that kind of weird stuff that nobody really understands, at least not from the IT folks. You have to be an uh, astronomy guy. Anyway, so um, the idea is that what you do is you have a set of filters and the filter basically receives data at the left side, does something with it and pumps it out on the right side. And um, if you want to build... Um, a complex, for example, image transformation or filtering system, then you can build a chain of 
filters which are connected by pipes. So pipes basically receive the data from one from the out, outgoing side of, of, of uh, the left hand filter and then transport it over to the following to the upcoming filter. And of course if the system for example is asynchronous in that um, one filter might produce data faster than the other one can consume it, then it's um, the job of the pipe to, to queue the data and, and make sure that everybody uh, can work at their own pace. Um, a couple of other known uses uh, are compilers, for example. A compiler is often also some kind of pipes and filters design, although it's not always that explicit, where um, the data is, uh, the, the, the program is first parsed, then it's analyzed, then the abstract syntax, syntax tree is built, then you do some kind of error checking, then you create some kind of intermediate representation, you optimize on that one, and then you create the backend code. So that's also a very typical pipes and filters design. Another very well-known pipes and filters, filters application is the Unix shell, where the term pipe, you know, the, the vertical bar, is actually literally used to connect various command line applications. So let's look at some of the consequences. Um, of course, the primary idea of this pattern is that you can reuse the filter components and build different filter chains by just recombining existing filters through pipes then, of course. Um, you can then also, uh, the idea of having pipes uh, uh, queue data if one is faster than the other one, um, if the, the pr previous um, filter produces faster data faster than the subsequent one can consume it um, so you can isolate the queuing aspect into the filters uh, sorry into the pipes also if you if you want you can even use parallel parallelism here so if if you have very slow filters because they do a very powerful transformation then you can have several of them in parallel uh, working on the data, assuming the data or the problem can be parallelized so you can work independent on, in different regions. That's not always the case. What are some of the negative consequences? First of all, and, and that's probably the most important one, um, if, you have, if you have two um, filters where filter 1 produces data that filter 2 uh, wants to consume, then the data that is exchanged has to be known or the data structure has to be known to both of them. So you tie them together um, basically by having common data structures which the one side produces and the other one consumes. So you have to agree on the data structure. And that's of course a problem because it, as I said it, it ties together otherwise independent filters. And to avoid that problem, you can, of course, have the pipes do some kind of data transformation. So you have um, some kind of transformation logic in the pipes so that you uh, have uh, that, that the filters themselves are independent. Of course, then you have the overhead of doing the transformation in the, in the pipes, which is also a problem. Another thing that has to be considered is error handling. Because if you have an error in, for example, filter number five, um, there is no, there's not necessarily any way how the previous filters can be notified because they might already have finished. So since this is inherently asynchronous, you need some kind of way to handle errors by some notification or logging or callback or whatever. So this can also be a bit intricate. Nonetheless, uh, pipes and filters are something that's also very widely used and really uh, a very fundamental and important architectural pattern. Uh, the next pattern is the, the blackboard pattern and in that pattern um, you basically throw all the, the data that you have on the blackboard and you have specialized uh, workers um, that operate on that uh, common set of data and um, in the original documentation by POSA 1 it it went into the uh, direction of artificial intelligence or of, of having um, um, partitioned responsibilities that magically work together and produce an end result. Um, in, in daily uh, practice, 
Um, I would call it more of a shared repository. And so I see um, the, those two concepts very related and, and shared repository, actually the one who is more widely used uh, today that you um, very often even persisted uh, the, the data in a, in a central database and you have some uh, front ends that just collect and gather the data and you have some back ends that process on the data um, time independent or just decoupled uh, from the, the original um, front end um, services. So, so traditionally, this pattern has been used in expert systems where the idea was that, you know, if you don't have, if, if you want to optimize the algorithm with which the expert system finds a solution to a problem, you just add additional workers that pick up data that's in certain states as you learn how to solve the problem. So, you know, you could, you could add additional um, problem solving agents to your overall architecture without changing the system's you know fundamentals you could easily add additional building blocks or additional additional logic yeah and um, one of the common situations where you would apply such a uh, shared repository um, design would be um, when you have uh, for example some real-time processing going on that captures the data and shouldn't be influenced and, and impacted by any batch processing uh, running in, in the background, maybe at nightly uh, runs or uh, just who, which can uh, run independently uh, of it. And so similar to the uh, pipes and filters pattern, you could... you can decouple responsibilities you can have parallelism you can have multiple workers working on the same data um, and whereas in the pipes and filters uh, pattern you had them working on different sets of data so the this data was disjoint and um, here in the, the blackboard in the shared repository pattern they work actually on the same data items of course uh, you then easily come into the the problems of uh, synchronizing the the results of transactions and and all those uh, nightmares although this is really an interesting point because um, there has been a system called linda um, by david gelanto don't know what kind of nationality is so i don't know how to pronounce his name um and and he also used this repository approach but not for this expert system and ai ai kind of stuff but rather to build distributed concurrent systems because um, he only provided a limited number of primitive operations with which uh, the agents could uh, access the repository things like uh take and put and check whether it's there and then take you know those like atomic operations on a shared repository, just like on shared memory. And he showed that many of the typical problems you'll face in distributed parallel systems can be avoided by using this kind of Linda-based architecture. Um, um, it didn't really kind of pan out. Not too many, I don't know many systems that use this approach. One um, kind of prominent um, implementation uh, is java spaces which is uh, an implementation of this technology um, that's actually part of genie or genie is built on top of this one i don't know no i, th I think java spaces evolved out of genie kind of okay this way so so but again there's not many systems that use it but but it's really an interesting approach and th what's interesting from a patterns theory viewpoint um, is that the 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 Java spaces in Linda kind of thing is different from Blackboard because although it uses the same idea, the same solution, a common repository where agents work with atomic operations, it's certainly a different pattern because the forces and the problem are completely different. In the Blackboard pattern, originally, it's this AI uh, worker algorithm, non-deterministic stuff, whereas in the other... Um, case it's about concurrency and atomicity and concurrency so different patterns very similar solution so let's look at the consequences yeah um having the the ai variant of it so the, the original blackboard uh, it's good for experimentation for uh, just fiddling around with uh, constellations of responsibilities how you could optimize uh, your solution, how you could create new ways of finding a potential solution. Um, of course, the, the, the separation of the individual um, 
responsibilities through the shared repository, through, through the Blackboard, um, improves exchange exchangeability and maintainability of the system. And uh, here the, the, the system is also, this, this pattern is also very often used. It, it makes the system fault tolerant and robust because, well, yeah, the individual responsibilities might fail, but the data might be still there if right. replicated. Right, that, that's the point. This, this fault tolerance and robustness is, of course, only relevant if it's a distributed repository. So processes or, or even machines can fail, whereas the other workers are still there. Uh, as a consequence, it's, of course, uh, very difficult to test. Uh, uh, you can imagine uh, having the individual responsibilities operate on the same data, now track and trace and, and debug uh, what's going on. Well, it's a nightmare. Um, well, no optimal solution uh, is guaranteed. Well, it, it just proceeds as it, as it goes. And uh, it, it's, it's just again this AI stuff, you know. Yeah. The, regarding the, the efficiency, you have uh, when you have uh, concurrent accesses to the same data, you have transactions. You need to really be careful uh, not to access the same data, and and this might slow out, um, pace down your your system. So you might have a low efficiency here. Yeah, and 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 just to to <laughs> to mention this, uh, it always sounds like we we're kind of making fun of artificial artificial intelligence, but that's I think that's not what we want to do. I think AI has its has has its merits, but it's certainly not the blackboard pattern that is you know that decides about success and failure of AI. They have completely different techniques and different paradigms about which we might talk in a future episode. So this pattern is somewhat I don't know. I would call it shared repository. Then yeah, it works for me. And forget about the AI stuff. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, microkernel. That's a pattern you probably have all heard about because Windows NT uh, uh, and, and some other operating systems um, are built on top of it. So the idea is that uh, the microkernel pattern is useful for systems that adapt to changing system hardware, whatever, requirements. It separates a minimal functional core from extended functionality and customer-specific parts. The kernel also serves as a socket for plugging in these ex extensions and, a co uh, and coordinate their collaboration. So in operating systems, you know this. You have a very small kernel usually, and then you have drivers, which are somewhat privileged. They can work very near to the kernel very efficiently, and then you host have the external services, known as applications, in uh, operating systems, which are somewhat more uh, somewhat further away from the kernel itself and of course if you have a well layered architecture where the microkernel is a very low layer that's another way to see it i think um, then of course changing the microkernel will make sure that um, or, or porting the microkernel to a different environment will make sure that the rest of the applications which are based on top of the microkernel is still uh, working so Michael, um, I don't know. Do do you do you see this very different from 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 layers? I I see it uh, different uh, because it it has a, a different focus, where layers just help me to structure my system uh, into into yeah layers of responsibility. This here helps me to encapsulate uh, responsibility even horizontally. Um, okay. so for example. In the remoting episode, we discussed uh, the the Corba architecture already, and so when I have to talk about a microkernel pattern, I I like to refer to the Corba architecture because that for me implements a, a typical microkernel. You have the ORB core with a minimal function functionality to transport um, a request from A to B. And uh, it doesn't care about the data types. It doesn't care about uh, specific incarnations of whether you use it for notifications, for events, for, for two-way uh, invocations between A and B. It just has a basic means of transporting uh, messages. And then you have those extensions. You have those plugins, for example, interceptors. You have uh, the proxies. Uh, you have the... the decoding uh, part you have the invoker and and uh, the marshaller and those are all extensions to the the op core uh, which made it 
uh, succeed for a certain while and uh, well we don't have to discuss uh, its, its situation today um, but uh, for for that extent it it was quite successful and extensible to to a certain extent um, and uh, the the op core is the microkernel in that case and and the 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 further libraries are the extensions of the microkernel right so 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 again coming back would you agree that um microkernel is layers where the lowest layers are made as uh, narrow with as small an interface as possible yeah, yes but also kind the of. horizontal effect so that the same level of a abstraction i would uh, factor ah, uh, okay. out That's and the find point. a minimal point okay Consequences, well, um, of course, uh, it uh, improves the portability. Only the, the microkernel needs to be ported because all the extensions then base on the microkernel on its API. Um, if In reality, if you change uh, the, the operating system or things, you, you have also um, porting effort at, that, at the extension level. But still, the, the key effort, the, the, the most effort should be uh, spent at the microkernel level only. Um, you have extensibility. Well, that is all, or that is the key what, what you use the microkernel pattern for, uh, to be extensible, to be flexible. Um, and uh, yes, it, it, it scales to a uh, certain extent, to, to a certain uh, limits. And uh, I don't know how you uh, could know in advance um, where the limit is. Or I, I often have the feeling that a certain microkernel architecture has its limits and, and you reach them at some, some end. So it's scalable, but with some limits when you just extend it or want to extend it with things that it was not supposed to do yeah. in advance. One example, going back to the Corba example, was when really implementing asynchronous communication on, on top of the inherently uh, synchronous yeah. uh, communication in, in the broker architecture. I guess we get also to broker then, then later. Yeah. Yeah. Then here, the, the, it was really stretched, the, 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 the means. Yeah, so because the core abstraction of the microkernel <coughs> was wrong. Or, or not yeah. suitable for the new kind yeah, of Yeah, was, was not supposed to support that initially. Yeah. As a further liability, the, the complexity um, we should mention. And uh, here the point is that uh, designing the extensions on top of this minimal set of, uh, of an API of the, of the microkernel can be quite cumbersome and, and grow complex for, for doing, well, complicated things. And also performance might suffer because you have to work around some of the minimalist uh, operations provided by the microkernel and, and do weird stuff because the abstractions provided by the microkernel are not 100% fitting to what you would, would like to do. Next one is the broker pattern. Um, we discussed the broker pattern in the remoting uh, episodes already in, in large detail. and But it, Let's discuss it in, in its architectural uh, concept, context, uh, the outside view, the impact of a broker uh, pattern in an architecture. And here the broker helps to connect previously um, um, distributed components to a new um, system. and uh, or, or put it the other way, uh, it allows you to distribute your components in a in a distributed uh, network, a distributed setting. And um, in, in current uh, developments of projects, we learned that uh, there is some uh, tight t coupling uh, involved when doing that. And so the today, uh, today we have a trend to going to, to publish, subscribe to messaging um, architectures where you don't have this tight coupling, uh, where you don't have invocations at a at a component or even object level as you had previously or, or originally with the broker architectures, uh, but have a loose coupling between the invocations. I don't want to mention now uh, SOA and and <laughs> web services. They they definitely go into that direction. Yeah. Um. So we won't discuss the broker any further here because we did this in the remoting episodes, right? Yes. Okay. 
as examples, uh, of course, it's it's the same candidates as we discussed in the in the remoting episode. It's Corva, .NET Remoting, Java RMI, DCOM. Okay, the next architectural style. This one I think is not described in POSA as a pattern, but doesn't matter. Still allowed to talk about it. Um, the workflow engine style. The, the idea is basically that you separate your application logic into typically stateless and rather primitive services that provide a certain functionality. And uh, on the other hand, you describe some kind of workflow, for example, as a state machine or an activity diagram or a Beeple or a BPMN diagram or whatever. And the idea is that there is some kind of workflow engine which executes the workflow and as part of the workflow, the primitive services or actions are called. Um, so... If, if you've listened to SOA part one, the episode with Eberhard, then you will recognize that service-oriented architecture is basically an implementation of the workflow engine architectural style because, as Eberhard said, one of the really important characteristics of a SOA is that you explicitly describe the processes that are happening in your, in your uh, enterprise, I should say, and that these... Um, uh, workflows or, or processes that you describe access services in terms of SOA um, to, to implement some of the side effects basically as the process um, proceeds. So um, this is a very hot topic then probably but nobody talks about it in terms of workflow engine. It's, it's, it's business process modeling and business process whatever these days. So um, of course known uses workflow systems that's the whole point of workflow systems where you describe workflows typically graphically and then um, they can access like Corba objects or web services or whatever else as part of their actions. And of course, as I said, SOA is basically the same thing. Um, so consequences, the workflow is easily configurable. So you typically have your basic services um, and you can easily compose them into different applications by just drawing or otherwise modeling a different um, process. Um, you can also easily exchange the activities. You don't have to touch the process necessarily. And you can, of course, reuse uh, some of the basic um, um, some of the basic services in different processes or workflows. So that's, that's the whole idea, separating out the process part of an application. Um, and as I said, very, very hype these days. Um, negative, um, although you could argue whether this is really negative, you have a very strict application model. You, you can't you know, implement all kinds of use cases because you have to restrict yourself to the idea of having services on the one hand side and the workflow or the process on the other hand side. Now, I think this is actually an advantage because you will only use um, this architectural style for applications which naturally can be um, like decomposed into services and the process. And then this is a very natural fit. And, and, and again, this is the whole idea behind uh, using this pattern in SOA. You have business processes in your, in your enterprise and you really want to represent them as a first-class citizen and not as something that's somewhere implemented in your application code somehow. The next um, style or technique that we want to discuss uh, are uh, component architectures. Component architectures or the component container principle um, is very useful when you want to separate uh, especially technical uh, concerns like security, persistency, uh, etc. Um, into uh, away from the application, away from the component into a, a container and uh, when you want to um, reuse those concerns, the infrastructure there for, for various applications. Uh, typical implementation uh, examples are EJB um, or Complus or the, the dot .NET uh, framework. Uh, Corba Microsoft. components, right? Corba components, but kind of dead. I mean, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it it was it used to be a good example uh, extending the EJB model, but now I ch think just everybody does EJB or 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 even other things like Spring or some more lightweight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, although EJB three point zero, everything is good now. 
the advantage of of course uh, is that you uh, have hopefully reusable components that um, if at all only depend on the technology now today with ejb3 um, and annotations you depend less on the infrastructure as previously um, and, um, and and of course a primary idea is that application developers don't have to care about the technical concerns because they're hand handled more or less magically by the application server Yes, uh, an important uh, topic is also concurrency. If you move yeah. the concurrency into the, the container, um, you get a lot uh, of um, hassle, a lot of um, um, risk into d out of your project. Yeah, and then again, this is a very a very big topic on its own, and we'll probably have some kind of episode on application servers and component containers later, so we're not going to discuss this in too much detail. Um, uh, dinner is waiting so we have to hurry up um, the last thing I guess we want to discuss um, or also just mention because it's something we should talk about in a separate episode is frameworks um, and everybody knows what a framework is I guess so there are several um, definitions for example one that I read by Eric Gamma says a framework is a set of cooperating classes which together make up a reusable design for a specific kind of software a framework provides an architectural guidance by structuring the system in abstract classes as well as their responsibilities and interactions the framework developer framework user adapts the framework to his specific needs by deriving concrete classes or by assembling classes provided by the framework so this is very very strict definition that's probably too narrow other people say a framework is just the Hollywood principle don't call us we call you so you provide a couple of callbacks and the framework calls into these callbacks whenever it thinks is necessary so there is one important difference between a framework and, and a general purpose library and that is again that the callback idea so if you if you use a library it's up to you to define the overall application flow the overall you know macroscopic application structure and you can use fine-grained services provided by libraries in a framework it's different the framework provides the overall structure the overall flow the overall metaphor for the application and you just provide details to the overall thing for example if you have a drawing application which can draw all kinds of nice things then you can extend this application framework by new figures so you provide an implementation of a figure class for example and then the overall drawing application can use this figure as if it had been there all the time so that's different from from libraries one important thing is that if you define a framework it's easy to get it too generic so it you know there is the danger that you might want to make it handle all kinds of cases so the framework is going to become big and very very hard to use and you have to make sure you avoid this but again this is something for a separate episode there are other things that are interesting to talk about architecturally for example reflection meta programming plugins but again this is stuff for separate episodes we've taken the appropriate notes um so before we uh, finish with this episode, the question remains: Now, okay, we we have these we have these architectural patterns. What role do they play play in architecting a system? How do you actually use them? Well, as we uh, briefly discussed at the beginning of the episode, um, you start off with a set of responsibilities. Um, for example, designed using CRC cards, uh, class responsibility collaboration cards, uh, initially um, documented and uh, not to say invented by Ward Cunningham. You start off with those um, uh, responsibilities. You have interactions between them, and now you 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 list your non-functional requirements and and skim through in your mind through the patterns that you know through the styles and and apply it and and look at it and and at that moment um, assess how the result would be what um, what kind of consequences you would have uh, how how you would actually fulfill now uh, applying this pattern in this situation the 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 the, the non-functional requirements and 
after a while doing that, it, it's then just a gut feeling. You, you right. hear about a, a set of responsibilities, you hear about some constraints, and you initially uh, point on one of the styles, on one of the patterns, and uh, it becomes pretty easy, pretty soon, a, a gut feeling that you apply. And uh, it's the uh, one of the um, toolkits of, of an architect um, applying those styles uh, with wisdom not everywhere where it fits uh, it's it's of uh, use and, and benefit of the project so um, when having decided for an architectural style um, do some discussion document it have it reviewed by others to get their opinion whether this architectural style really resolved all your forces that that you are faced in, in, in your project and in your specific context. So I'd like to add one, one or two or five sentences to that. One is that I think usually architectural styles aren't used literally. So they serve as a kind of stepping stone when finding your solution, your architectural solution. So so if you, if you picture your architectural design space as a three-dimensional three space, and you start, you know, at the origin, and you wander around and try to find the right spot where you, you know, where all your fo forces are balanced, and where your your architectural has a has a nice implementation, nice structure. Then the design, the architectural patterns are like certain points in in this three or whatever dimensional space and you wander around and you get you know you get near a certain architectural style and you're basically you you gravitate to that style and you say okay now i have the pipes and filters pattern let's see whether this fits and then you might say oh no it doesn't fit so you go on wandering around again you kind of gravitate to a different pattern and then you think oh yeah that might fit and then you evaluate the forces and see how much you have to tweak it so that it actually fit, fits your problem okay I think that's it for this episode. As we said before, dinner is waiting. We have to stop. So thanks for listening and bye-bye. Um, See you next time. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comments system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.